And today's um, webinar is um, in commemoration of World AIDS Day and the theme is Equalized. We'll hear more about it. But in addition to the overview of the guidelines, we'll also have Dr. Peter Rumonio, who is um, a senior technical advisor at um, CHEB Kenya. And he will be talking about what um, is priority for funding uh, because most of the HIV services are actually funded by the HIV program in, in Kenyatta and, and within the countries um, is through donor funding. So he'll be telling us what the priorities are for next year. And then Dr. Okiko, uh, who is the pharmacist in charge at um, the Comprehensive Care Center will be uh, discussing pharmacovigilance, especially now that there was a batch of TLD that was uh, recalled by um, the government, just helping people understand more about that and, and how we employ pharmacovigilance in, in managing our patients. So I'll start off with the overview of the 22 guidelines and uh, really just discussing more about the theme. But before I do so, maybe uh, Dr. Rumunyu and Dr. Okiko, you can just um, introduce yourselves briefly so that people can hear you as I share yeah. my screen. Yeah, sure. So thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kamau. Yeah, as you've heard, my name is Dr. Peter Rumunyu and uh, uh, good afternoon to you all. Uh, we work, I work at CHEP Kenya and um, I support the National Referral Hospitals to implement the Center of Excellence package um, in HIV programming. I'm glad to be here today to discuss with you on COP22 priorities later on. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Kiko. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Kamau. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Andrew Kiko. I'm a clinical pharmacist. Uh, within Kenyatta, seconded to CCC. Um, I've worked in the infectious disease unit for a while. Uh, so, but today we'll be sharing a bit on uh, what has been on the news on uh, the TLD uh, uh, product that is in circulation. So we'll hear more later. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So I'll just be, um, start us off on really just thinking about um, what the theme is. And the theme for 2022 World AIDS Day is Equalize. And the question I ask there is what are the inequalities that are hindering us from ending the HIV AIDS uh, pandemic? And so what is the finish line in terms of um, how, do we, how do we achieve epidemic control of HIV and AIDS? How do we end this uh, pandemic? And for us to do that, we need to ensure that 95% of the people living with HIV know their HIV status, 95% are on ART and 95% are virally uh, suppressed. And these are the 95, 95, 95 targets. And by doing that, we ensure that there are zero new HIV infections, zero HIV related deaths and zero HIV um, discrimination will actually enable us to do that. So in terms of progress on 95, 95, 95, where are we? We're at 85% knowledge of HIV status. And of all the people who are living with HIV, because there are about 39 million people living with HIV in the world, 1.7 are less than 15 years, and 5 point, around 6 million people don't know that they're living with HIV. So of all the people in the world living with HIV, 75% are on ART and 68% of all the people living with HIV are virally suppressed. But when we look at those who, who have been identified, yeah, so this is excluding the 6 million who have yet to know their HIV status, 88% of those who know their HIV status on, are on ART. And 92% of these are virally suppressed. So as of 2022, where we are with zero new HIV infections, there, there were 1.5 uh, million new HIV infections in the year 2021. But when we look at where we've come from, in 1996, we were at 3.2 million. In 2010, we were at uh, 2.2 million. When we look at zero HIV-related deaths, in 2021, 650,000.
Hello, Dr. Wanguyan. Um, can you hear me? Can I share my screen? Yes, go ahead. Where did uh, I lose you? Um, just show your screen, I'll uh, let you know. Can you see the screen? Yes, I can see the screen. Uh, please put, put it on slideshow. Yes, you're on this slide. This slide? Yeah. Okay, so on this slide, I was talking about um, of those who know their HIV status, 88% um, of them are on ART, and 92% uh, of these are virally suppressed. So this slide is looking at those who know their HIV status. This slide is looking at all the people living with HIV. And really that's the case for, for, uh, for thinking about these inequalities and really understanding that we are not yet there in terms of um, ending HIV and AIDS. So now looking at zero uh, new HIV infections, in 2021, there were 1.5 million new um, HIV infections, but this has it's, there's been a decline because in 1996 it was uh, there were 3.2 million new HIV infections. And when you're talking about uh, HIV-related deaths, in the year 2021 there were 650,000 uh, HIV-related deaths, and this has come down from 2004 where we were at 2 million. And when you're looking at discrimination, a study that was done. Um, in Uganda and Cameroon showed that over a third of the patients who are living with HIV had experienced HIV related stigma, but there was more stigma for key populations and this was hindering access to services. So if we may ask what inequalities are we talking about? What is hindering us from reaching the finish line? And inequalities are stopping the world from ending AIDS. And what kind of inequalities are we talking about? We're talking about gender inequalities. We're talking about discrimination, criminalization, and stigmatization of key populations. We're talking about children falling far behind adults living with HIV. We're talking about racial and ethnic inequalities you'll find in, in, um, in higher income countries. Uh, for example, in the States, you'll find that mostly um, it's people of um, African-American ethnic groups that tend to have higher, um, higher, level, uh, higher numbers of people living with HIV. And in places like Europe, it's, uh, it's people who are immigrants will actually be living in the virus. And then there is reducing funding for the response. So when you talk about gender inequalities, what are we talking about? In 2021, adolescent girls were three times more likely to acquire HIV infection than boys and young men the same age. And actually, if we quantify this, one every three minutes uh, of adolescent, in, in, in one, one adolescent girl and young woman every three minutes was acquiring HIV in the year 2021. And also women undergoing intimate partner violence are three times more likely to acquire HIV infection and it's been found that if you educate women, you're going to reduce the risk of HIV infection by 50%. So if we get more women to actually complete schools, and if you look at our, um, our setups, you find that girls tend to, tend to not complete um, their education more than, more than boys. So those are the gender inequalities we're talking about. And then there's toxic masculinity, uh, masculinity or unequal power dynamics between men and women reduce, causing um, reduction of decision making among women. And this reduces access to HIV prevention services. And also one thing we've discovered is that there's the need for improved service delivery targeting men. Men actually, if you look at um, uh, mortality, they are, they are, there's higher mortality from men. And then looking at the source of infection, in 2021, the UNAIDS report, it was found that, you know, women, men were twice more likely to be the source of infection. And uh, specifically for the ages 35 to 39 years, um, at that age, uh, men were six times more likely to have been the source of um, HIV transmission. So really, we need to target our services around men and and ensure that you know, they get services that are uh, population specific and, and encourage them to take them up. So when you're talking about discrimi discrimination, criminalization and stigmatization of key populations, 
we found that 70% of new HIV infections were from key population and their sexual partners. And men who, people who inject drugs had a 35 times greater risk of acquiring HIV infection than those who do not inject drugs. And female sex workers were at 30 times more likely to acquire HIV infection than adult women aged 15 to 49 in the general population. And gay, men who have sex with men who are 28 times more likely to acquire um, HIV infection in the age bracket of 15 to 49 years. And transgender women are 14 times more likely to acquire the infection. And when you think about these key populations, these are populations who are marginalized in terms of resources for you know, HIV prevention and even prioritizing um, services that, um, that target this population. So what happens is they have reduced access to um, HIV prevention services. And when you're thinking about um, community and even the HIV response, it is not community centric. And that's one thing we need to change. Then when you're talking about children and adolescents living HIV, and we are talking about um, pe pediatric HIV, which is ve very much preventable. When you're looking at um, children, they're lagging behind um, adults. In terms of knowledge of HIV status, the green bar represents children. You can see children are, are at 59%. In terms of people living HIV on treatment, it's 52%. In terms of viral suppression, it's 41%. And you can see for adults, the higher rates of knowledge of HIV status and even uh, being on ART and, you know, and being virally suppressed. And in terms of the number of children living with HIV, um, they're about, they're about 2.7 uh, people living with HIV. And even um, in terms of HIV transmission, we found that 61% um, of infections are actually in adolescents and young people. And when we look at uh, vertical transmission uh, and looking at the percentages of um, vertical HIV transmission by cause of transmission globally, globally, and you can look at it in Eastern and Southern Africa, where 57% of people living with HIV reside. You can see 9,000 was for, 9,000 uh, was from, mothers who were on ART but did not achieve viral suppression. And 19,000 was for mothers who did not continue ART during pregnancy or breastfeeding. And mothers who did not receive antiretroviral therapy during pregnancy or breastfeeding accounts for 27,000. And mothers who acquired um, HIV during pregnancy or breastfeeding accounts for 22,000. And you can actually see from um, our local data when you're looking at the children who are infected during pregnancy and children infected um, during uh, breastfeeding, there are quite a number of women who are dropping off ART. And um, you find that those who are infected during breastfeeding majority is from, from um, new HIV infections. So this tells us that we have some way to go in terms of um, eliminating mother to child transmission of HIV which in this day and age, uh, we should not be talking about pediatric HIV. So just briefly, what, what is the fourth 90? So I hope with those slides that I've convinced you that there are some inequalities that we have to work together towards ending. We have to um, enable, enable uh, uh, pregnant and breastfeeding women to get access to ARVs. We have to have a community centric um, response for key populations because 70% of um, HIV transmission is from key populations. And we really need to address gender inequalities towards so that we can um, end this pandemic. So what is the fourth 90? And, and we really need to ensure that people living with HIV experience healthy aging. And this means that we need to improve the quality of life for people, people living with HIV. So you'll find um, for those who are on medication, now we're no longer talking about op opportunistic infections, we're actually talking about NCDs. And it's a reality that older populations have not been prioritized in HIV prevention and treatment programs. And, and now in this day and age, people are living longer. 
with universal ART. As much as um, in the slides before I've talked about, you know, access to ART being disproportionate among the population. So with a population of people living HIV who are living longer, we need to understand the effect of aging on HIV and the effect of HIV on aging. And the aim is to improve the quality of life for people who are living HIV. So we not only want you to be on ART, but we want you to live longer. And when we are talking about, you know, how there's chronic um, immune activation and CD4 depletion with HIV and having, um, putting our patients on ART and stopping, and stopping um, the CD4 depletion, what continues to go on is um, chronic inflammation. And with that, you get uh, risks of comorbidities like cardiovascular disease, even the, um, and non-HIV related cancers, uh, kidney disease, liver disease, osteopenia and neurocognitive uh, disorders. So these are things we need to now look for within our patients. And I thought I'd briefly just let us know what the experience has been like um, in KMH and really just looking at the challenges that we have faced. And one of them is mortality. For 15% of our patients, we're not able to link them to ART because they die. Uh, before they are linked. And this just looks at um, the year that has been and looks at the mortality um, per month. And we can see we have up to, you know, 26% uh, mortality of those who are identified. In terms of viral suppression, we have actually uh, been doing well as, as um, this shows, this just looks at our viral suppression uh, through different ages. And you can see at least we're above 90% for um, our children and adolescents living with HIV. In adults, you know, we've been able to achieve viral suppressions of, you know, above 95%. So looking at the NCDs that we see in our patients who are on care, majority of them have um, hypertension and they're actually on management for the same. And what we are really thinking about is integrating NCD screening and management better within our CCC. Much as they're able to screen them, sometimes you have to send them out to buy the medication for the NCDs. And we're looking, for, looking at making our CCC a one-stop shop that we're able to screen and manage uh, for NCDs because these are things that are becoming more common. And, and when you look at the age distribution, of um, the NCDs, you can see that majority of them are between the ages of um, above 50 years. And this really brought about why we need a senior citizens clinic within our CCC. And we're looking at the distribution of a population who are 50 years and above. You can see majority of our patients are above, um, are between the ages of 50 to 59. We even have uh, patients who are in their 80s within um, the CCC. And I'll briefly just take us through the outline of the guidelines in the next um, 15 or so minutes. And when you're looking at HIV testing, we need to make sure that there is a setting that the patient consents and, and there's confidentiality and they get very good counseling and that the providers provide the correct results and an opportunity to connect to, uh, to treatment and prevention. So we're not only interested in identifying those who are positive, but we're also identifying those who are at risk so that we can link them to HIV prevention services. And you can only do this when you create an enabling um, environment. So there's facility-based um, testing that like we do within uh, KNH, and there's also community-based testing. And we are recommending targeting, targeted HIV testing. So we are looking at those groups that are, are vulnerable and are likely to get infected. And we're also making sure that for every patient that we identify, we use them as an index client so they'll be able to get a list of sexual partners and, and children or even siblings if, if their index client is a child. And then we're also offering HIV self-testing for those who, whose partners, and really this is targeting the men, um, whose partners may not be able to come to the clinic, especially men, and also using a social network strategy so that we can get one person to tell us where we are likely to, to yield many positives or even opportunities for prevention. 
And we do this using an eligibility screening tool to identify the people at risk of HIV infection. So within the test, there's pre-test counseling, there's the HIV test itself, there's post-testing counseling, and there's assessment for other health-related conditions like populations undergoing gender-based violence, like those who are at risk of TB, we also do screening for TB and link them to, um, to, to further testing for TB. And then we also refer and link to other um, appropriate health services. So for those who identify positive, we link them to, to care and, and treatment. And for those who are identified negative and at risk of um, HIV, we link them to other services like PrEP. So in terms of the testing right now, we've shifted to a three test algorithm because of the declining HIV prevalence so that we can minimize the risk of a false positive. So basically this means that if you test and you're non-reactive, then we report you as negative. But if you tend to be, re if you are reactive and we do a confirmatory test and you're found um, reactive, you still need to undergo a third test but in case you're non-reactive on the second test, we'll still do another third test. If you find that you're reactive, we report you as inconclusive and test you in 14 days. And we'll go through the same thing. If you're still inconclusive, we'll, we'll test you after three months. So initially we used to actually uh, do a DNA PCR. So for PMTCT, we're also um, um, encouraging triple elimination of HIV. So we also have um, the dual HIV syphilis testing. Um, so all pregnant women and less known positive should actually undergo the dual test at first um, ANC visit. And if negative, we repeat this test at, um, the, in the third trimester. So for children of women who are identified as HIV positive or who are known as known to be HIV positive, they should undergo DNA PCR testing at six weeks. If they turn negative, they should have the test done at six months. If they turn negative, they have the test done at 12 months. If, um, if they are still negative, they will have a rapid antibody test at 18 months and then six weeks after complete cessation of breastfeeding. So if, if they turn positive um, with at, at, at any, any time they are doing a DNA PCR, they will also need to do confirmatory DNA testing. So the approaches to improve linkage are to ensure that you have a very good uh, and high quality post-test counseling. You support disclosure because um, non-disclosure of HIV status can actually be a barrier to linkage. And you look for and address other barriers to linkage. Um, one of these is things like gender-based uh, violence. So establish systems to facilitate linkage. So following these patients up and uh, in initiating, you know, a coordinated uh, care for, for instance, in our setup in Kenhit, what we do is for those who are identified as positive, they have escorts to come to the CCC. So when you encounter this um, uh, HIV, uh, newly identified uh, person living HIV, your initial evaluation should be a complete uh, medical, psychosocial and sexual history, a complete uh, physical exam with appropriate laboratory investigations. And within the physical examination, you'll be able to, you know, have a clinical diagnosis and do WHO staging. And if you find that the patient is WHO stage three or has a CD4 count of less than 200, you, you, you will say this person has an advanced, advanced HIV disease. And your priority for advanced HIV disease is to screen for any opportunistic infections or any NCDs treat uh, the opportunistic infections or the NCDs that you'll encounter. Sometimes you can find um, HIV associated nephropathy as, you know, a presenting, uh, presenting diagnosis for this patient. So also, um, once, once you have treated the opportunistic infections, you need to optimize therapy, make sure you give them good adherence support and you prevent um, opportunistic infections. So who, who qualifies for CD4 uh, testing? Every person who's newly identified um, HIV positive will have a baseline CD4 count. And for people living HIV above five years who had previously initiated ART and dropped off ART and are initiating after three months should have a CD4 count done. And individuals who have documented uh, persistent and suppressed viral load. So for differentiated, differentiated service delivery, 
all, all clients, so what differentiated service delivery is to identify clients who can actually be given uh, longer, longer refills. So they have reduced frequency of visits to the clinic, or you identify those who need more intense uh, follow-up. And those who need more intense follow-up are those who are newly identified or those who have a high viral load. So at every visit, you need to categorize who is established on care. And if they're established on care, they qualify for longer refills. And those who you can categorize as established on care are those who've been on their uh, current ERT regimen for more than six months, who have no active illness in the previous six months, who are adherent to scheduled clinic visits in the previous six months and have viral loads of less than 200 copies within the last six months. So these are the ones who should be transitioned to less intense differentiated service delivery models. So you can either get your ART within uh, the community or within the facility at reduced uh, frequency of visits. So you can get one clinic visit per six months. And that means you have longer dispensation of the ART. So what is the standard package of, of care for all people living with HIV? It's the fourth chapter of the guideline and th there are eight components. And this is um, antiretroviral therapy, positive health dignity and prevention, which includes GBV, in intimate partner violence screening, uh, and um, HIV education and counseling. So what, what is done within this positive health dignity and prevention is to provide basic HIV education, provide um, the, the people living with HIV with means of preventing, assisting disclosure to partners, um, and, if, if, and, and also providing opportunities for partners to be tested. If partners are negative, providing the opportunities for the partners to have PrEP. There's also screening for and prevention of specific um, opportunistic infections, uh, reproductive health services, screening for and management of non-communicable diseases, mental health screening and management, nutrition services, and prevention of um, other infections. So ART should be initiated immediately for all people living with HIV. So we only delay ART in people living with HIV who have crypto cryptococcal meningitis, cryptococcal disease, and TB meningitis. Um, for patients with pulmonary TB, the guidance is to initiate ART within two weeks. Um, it was found that there was no mortality benefit in delaying ART for patients with pulmonary TB. And that's why the current guidance is that we initiate ART within two weeks. When we talk about positive health, dignity, and prevention, we need to provide counseling and, and support for disclosure of HIV status to not only sexual partners, but even uh, people who are close to the patient, could be siblings, it could be even be children, and provide um, testing of these uh, children or sexual partners. We educate on you know, combination prevention of HIV using condoms and family planning screening for sexually transmitted infections and treatment, um, treatment adherent support and uh, pre-exposure prophylaxis for HIV negative sexual partners. We also provide uh, screening and support for gender-based violence and intimate partner violence and HIV um, education and counseling. So when you're screening and preventing OIs and we're really thinking about you know, things like TB which is very important, or and even things like PCP. And so within our current guidelines, we are no longer recommending um, cotrimoxazole preventive therapy as lifelong prophylaxis for patients with four counts more than 200. There's actually really no need for lifelong um, cotrimoxazole prophylaxis. But within our guidelines, we're recommending it for all HIV-exposed infants, um, HIV infected children less than 15 years of age, all people living with HIV more than 15 years of age, living in malaria endemic zones, uh, presenting in WHO stage three and four, omitting the criteria for advanced HIV disease, and, and having a CD4 count of less than 200, and patients with suspected treatment failure, and also all pregnant and breastfeeding women. So, um, all people living with HIV need to be screened for TB at every visit using an intensified case finding tool that asks the patient whether they've had cough for more than two weeks, fever for more than two weeks, weight loss, reduced play, 
night sweats and, and just looking for uh, symptoms of um, TB. And for those who screen negative, uh, we provide TB preventive therapy. For those who screen positive, then we uh, actively look for the TB. We do a gene expert in a chest X-ray. And all adolescents and people and adults living, uh, living in HIV should have a baseline CD4 count. And if they have a baseline CD4 count of less than 200, should be screened for cryptococcal infection using serum crag. So in our standard package of, of care for people living with HIV, we also offer reproductive health services. So screen for STIs at every visit, and we should determine the pregnancy intention for the women of the reproductive age at every visit. And for those who do not intend to be pregnant, we ensure that we meet their contraception need. And we actually offer family planning services within our CCC. All HIV positive women um, aged 18 to 65 years should be screened for cervical cancer. So we actually testing via um, HPV DNA testing. And if you're using this modality, you test every two years. And we, are, we actually even testing by via really, but if you, if you do via really, um, we do this every, every year. So we're also providing for screening for NCDs, including men mental health disorders. And so we need to integrate it within our CCC. What we're able to offer free of charge to the patient is BMI and, and um, screening for hypertension using DPs. But at the cost of the patient, they screen for diabetes. We screen for diabetes mellitus, dyslipidemia, and renal disease. And within our guidelines, we're recommending that we screen for this annually. Routine screening should also be provided for early detection of cervical cancer, breast cancer. So within our CCC, we're actually able to do cervical cancer and do breast self-examination, teach our patients to do breast self-examinations. Um, for bile cancer, prostate cancer, these will have to come um, out of the, the patient's course. And what we've done that has really helped um, integration of NCD screening and management is that we're educating the patients and encouraging them to save for screening for uh, the NCDs. So within a year, they'll be able to get maybe 2,000, 3,000 uh, for these tests, additional tests. But for mental health disorders, we're actually able to screen using PHQ-9 for depression. And now within our guidelines, we are being asked to screen for anxiety using the generalized anxiety disorder assessment. We actually have screening for alcohol and drug abuse using the CAGE screening, and this is provided to the patients at every uh, visit. Nutritional services, we need to provide assessment, counseling, and support for all people living with HIV. An introduction of appropriate complementary feeding. So for infants, um, for, so part of the nutritional assessment for HIV exposed infants, or even um, infants living with HIV, is that we're advising their mothers that they should be, the infants should be exclusively breastfed for six months and introduce complementary feeds at six months. And for HIV exposed infants, we are um, in, encouraging breastfeeding to go on for 24 months. We're also providing, um, you know, for prevention of other infections. And at, at, at enrollment, we encourage our patients to actually have a hepatitis B surface antigen test. And if it's negative, we're encouraging vaccination um, for those who are able to afford it. But what we offer within our CCC in Kenya, and which is being advocated for in the new guidelines is COVID vaccination and uh, HPV vaccination for adolescent girls who are aged 10 to 14 years. So in terms of adherence preparation, monitoring and support, this begins at post-test counseling and continues until at every visit and um, until ART initiation. And treatment preparation involves HIV education and counseling, identifying likely barriers to adherence and, and with the patient develop, developing an individualized adherence plan. And we need to assess the patient's readiness to begin ART using ART readiness assessment forms that are within the annexes of the guidelines. Um, adherence monitoring is done at every visit. So there are a set of four questions. The more risky scale that we administer in addition to pill counts. And if we are not convinced about adherence, we need to um, go further and look through the issues that may be causing um, lack of adherence and use more risky scale aid to do this. So we've talked about this uh, adherence counseling and support initiated from the time of um, ART initiation. 
And we do intense monthly there and support for newly identified patients until the third uh, month viral load results are available. So clients who have inadequate or poor adherence, we need to identify what adherence barriers are and address them together with the patient. And, as, and if after the three month viral load, um, a patient is suppressed, we still need to continue providing monitoring and counseling and support for adherence, but at a lower intensity and frequency, unless there are reasons to, you know, to look further into it. And one thing we are educating the, the patients on that is new within the guidelines is that if they have a lower than detectable level viral load and they are undetectable, they're also untransmissible. So they can't transmit the virus to someone else. So in case uh, the viral load is high after the three months or whenever the patient is on care, um, we need to initiate enhanced adherence counseling. And we do this as soon as the viral load is above 200 copies preferably within two weeks of getting this result. And the goal of an ESC is to assess barriers to adherence in a non-judgmental way and help the patient construct an adherence plan with concrete objectives. And we expect by the end of three sessions that are spaced two to four weeks apart, we are able to achieve good adherence and repeat a viral load um, after three months of good adherence. So patients with confirmed first line or second line treatment failure also need targeted counseling and education to prepare them for the new regimen so that you're able to support um, ongoing adherence. So when you're thinking about that, so now the sixth chapter is on ART in children, adolescents, and adults. And from birth to four weeks, the preferred first line is AZT, 3 t and and this really um, is because of the... Um, uh, pharmacokinetics are, are not stable in neonates for the drugs that we use above four weeks. So four weeks, above four weeks to less than 15 years, if you're less than 30 kgs, we put you on ABC, 3TC, and DTG as a first line. And for this, uh, we use weight-based dosing. But if you're above 30 kgs, um, you get the fixed drug combination of TDF, 3TC, and DTG, and that's tenofovir, lamivudin, and dolutegravir. And ABC, 3TC, DTG is abacavir, lamivudin, lamivudin, and dolutegravir. And this is the fixed dose combination drug that has 300, 350. And above 15 years, you still do the fixed dose combination of TDF, 3TC, and uh, dolutegravir. Tenofovir, alafenamide is going to be adopted as, you know, the first first line backbone as a preferred first line backbone once the fi fixed drug um, combination is available. And this one is uh, the patients are less likely to have renal toxicity and bone toxicity that is experienced with TDF. Second line, if you are an, on a dolutegravir based regimen, you need a DRT to, to the, uh, drug resistance testing to determine your second line. If you are on a lopinavir ritonavir uh, based regimen, you still need a DRT. But if you're on ABC 3TC, you're likely to be changed switch to AZT 3TC and, and DTG. If you're on a favorance based regimen, your second line will be a dolutegravir based regimen. If the first line was ABC, the preferred second line will be AZT and vice versa. If you're on AZT, ABC. If you're above 30 uh, kgs and you are on a dolutegravir based regimen um, or a PI based regimen, you'll need a DRT to determine your second line. If you're on a favorance based regimen, um, you, you'll be switched to a dolutegravir based regimen. So if you're on uh, tenofovir or abacavir with the favorance, you'll be switched to tenofovir and dolutegravir. If you're on EZT, you'll be switched to uh, tenofovir. So how frequently will we do the viral loads? So uh, for someone who is newly identified, whatever age you are, we'll do the first viral load at three months, after three months of ART initiation. If you're 20, between the ages of zero to 24 years, um, once you do that first viral load at three months, then you'll do the viral load um, every six months. If you're 25 years and older, you'll do the first viral load at three months as for everyone else, and then at 12 months, and then annually after that. For the breastfeeding and breast, uh, pregnant and breastfeeding population, you do the viral load at three months after ART initiation. That is if you are newly identified, then six monthly after that. 
if you're already on ART, you'll do it as soon as you uh, found to be pregnant and then every six months. And if you have been switched uh, regimens, whether it was a single drug substitution or switch from first line to second line, you need to do a viral load three months after the switch. So what is the goal of ART? And the goal of ART is for you to be lower than detectable levels and that's less than 50. But if you have a, a detectable uh, viral load, so between 50 to 999, you have low level viremia. And the problem with uh, a low, low level viremia is that there's an increased risk to treatment failure. And once you have treatment failure, you're at an increased risk of um, HIV associated uh, morbidity and mortality. So the low level viremia can either be low risk, and if it's low risk, it's between 50 to 199. But high risk, low level viremia is between 200 and 999. And suspected treatment failure is above 1000. For you to confirm treatment failure, you need to do another viral load after three months. And before you do this viral load, you need to have the patient undergo enhanced adherence counseling sessions and repeat the viral load after three months of excellent adherence. So for the patients whose viral load are, are between 200 and you know, and above 1,000, these patients need uh, to institute ESCs. And when you're doing ESCs for patients whose viral loads are above 1,000, you need to start preparing them for a regimen switch if adherence is not an issue. So if you do the viral load after three months, after excellent adherence and you confirm treatment failure, you need to decide whether you, you, you need to do a DRT or to switch regimens. If they're on first line, you, you'll probably be uh, switching regimens to second line. If they're on second line, you'll be thinking about doing a DRT as long as you have confirmed that your adherence is, is not the issue. So for patients whose viral loads are less than 200, they can still continue with longer refills, but you need to re-emphasize what the goal of ART to these patients is, and that is to remain lower than detectable level. So the goal of ART every patient needs to understand is to be less than 50 copies. So PMTCT, remember I talked about triple elimination of HIV, syphilis, and hepatitis B. So, you know, pregnant women should also be offered the hepatitis B surface antigen test at the first ENC visit. And then repeat the dual test if they are negative in the first trimester, in the second trimester. And ERTs should be initiated as soon as possible, ideally on the same day for all patients who test positive for, for all pregnant women and breastfeeding women who test positive for HIV as they are offered um, ongoing adherence support in the first line preferred regimen is TDF, PTC, and DTG. For infant prophylaxis, we offer EZT and Avirapine for six weeks, and then stop the EZT at six weeks and initiate cotrimoxazole at six weeks, because less than six weeks, there are side effects um, in, in the newborn that are not desirable, so we initiate it at six weeks. And you continue the nevirapine and inception until complete cessation of breastfeeding. Mm -hmm. So if for mothers who decide not to breastfeed their children, we can give prophylaxis, we can stop prophylaxis after they have had 12 weeks on nevirapine. So if you encounter the patient at um, eight months, that's when the mother dis discovers that she's living HIV, they start with AZT and nevirapine and they'll still be on septum until they stop breastfeeding. So we advise exclusive breastfeeding and we are really doing this and, and breastfeeding up to 24 months because they're making breastfeeding safe by putting the mother on ERT and putting the infant on prophylaxis. So TB, HIV co-infection, we offer screening and prevention services at every visit and TB preventive therapy should be offered to every uh, person living HIV at least once in their lifetime and use a symptom-based screening tool to do this and those who screen positive should complete a definitive diagnostic pathway and those who screen negative should be evaluated for TB preventive therapy. So for adult people living with HIV and these are 15 years and above, um, they qualify for rifapentine and isoniazid uh, once weekly for three months. So the only people who cannot take rifapentine and isoniazid are those who are on PI based regimens 
because of drug to drug interactions, which will lower their um, ARV levels. So for these adult populations on PI based regimens and children and adolescents living HIV below 15 years, any patient with intolerance or contraindication to 3HP like uh, chronic alcoholics uh, should not get this regimen. Um, should, and, and pregnant women uh, should be on isoniazid once a day for six months. Um, I talked about the diagnostic pathway. Um, I just want to talk briefly about TB lump. Uh, TB lump should not be used as, as an alternative to gene expert. Um, for TB, what, what research has shown is that um, it helps when the patient is in WHO stage three or four or has a CD4 count of less than 100. So you're likely to get false negatives for those who are, are actually uh, not very ill. So for what do you do when you're for patients with uh, HIV and TB co-infection at birth to four weeks, you'll not change the regimens, but you can start ART after four weeks of age once uh, tolerating anti-TB drugs, but you start the anti-TBs um, immediately. For patients who are on ABC, 3TC and DTG, you, you double the dose of DTG. So you, you give DTG in the morning and the um, evening. And you continue with this for an additional two weeks after TB treatment. And the same goes for those who want TLD, you double the dose of DTG until two weeks after completing anti-TBs. So like I said, we need screening for hepatitis B and those who are negative um, will be offered the vaccination. But for children living with HIV who, uh, who, who completed routine vaccination, we know that um, they are offered the vaccine. So those who report that they did not complete routine uh, childhood immunization will need to be screened for hepatitis B. And the recommended first line in TB, in HIV, HBV co-infection is TLD. Remember that TLD and, and uh, tenofovir and lamivudine treat both uh, hepatitis B and HIV. So PEP should be offered as soon as possible within 72 hours after high risk exposure. And the recommended ARV agents are just similar to those um, that treat um, HIV infection, and they are shown uh, in the slide. So PrEP, so pre-exposure prophylaxis. So you give this to prevent HIV acquisition by someone who is HIV negative. So within our guidelines, you, there's opportunity for daily oral PrEP using TDF or uh, lamiv lamivudine, but the preferred is TDF and citabine as a fixed dose combination of 300, 200 milligrams. Well, TDF, 36, 300, 300 milligrams as a fixed dose combination. You can also have event-driven uh, oral prep that is just for men. So those who are assigned male at birth and are not taking um, estradiol-based gender affirming hormones because this will actually bring down the levels of the drug uh, that will prevent HIV infection. Transgender women and non-binary individuals assigned male at birth and not taking gender-affirming hormones can also take this event to prevent PrEP. And these are people who are able to time um, the se sexual intercourse. So you take two pills between two to 24 hours in advance of the anticipated event. One pill after one day after the first two pills, and then one pill uh, two days after the first two pills. And this is just using the same drug that we use for the daily oral prep. For women, they can use the dapivirine vaginal ring, uh, 25 milligrams of dapivirine inserted vaginally and used for 28 days continuously without removal. So how do we monitor prep? We do a HIV test before initiating prep. And then one month after, three months after initiating prep and then three months, every three months. We also need to do UECs, and for patients who are 50 years and above, we screen every six to 12 months for renal failure because TDF can give renal toxicity. To also test, uh, also make sure as much as you may initiate PrEP for those who are less than 50 years, or even above 50 years that you, you initiate, you do the test within three to one to three months of PrEP initiation, ideally at this point. For clients with any renal co comorbidity, you do not initiate PrEP until you see the UECs. And then screen for renal toxicity every six to 12 months. Um, like you said, 
for, for patients who are at, at risk of HIV infection, they're also at risk of hepatitis B infection and hepatitis C infection. So they need to have screening for hepatitis B. Uh, and, if, and if they test negative, it gives them the vaccination. We also need serology for hepatitis C and then ensure that you at least do it every year for patients at high risk of hepatitis C infection. And for both hepatitis B and C, do this within three months of uh, PrEP initiation. We're actually at the end of the overview of the guidelines. This is the last chapter, regular testing and, and counseling and linkage should be provided for people who inject drugs and offer, you know, comprehensive HIV treatment and prevention services, including harm reduction, counseling and support. We've seen that KPOPs and people who inject drugs are actually uh, the highest contributor of new HIV infections in the last year. So the recommended first line is TDF, TTC, and DTG. And in, in addition to screening for HIV, you need to screen, diagnose, and treat STIs, provide access to TB prevention, screening, and treatment, screening for hepatitis B, linkage to needle and syringe programs so that they have access to sterile injecting equipment and linkage to medically assisted therapy. So these were actually the NASCOP um, sensitization uh, guide, uh, guideline uh, slides. In addition to the, uh, yeah, then the slides that I, I presented before the overview of the guidelines were actually my own slides, just helping us to get to know what the theme is for the year. So we'll, we'll have Dr. Okiko just giving us um, an overview of what to do with um, pharmacovigilance, and then Dr. Gumuni will just talk about our funding priorities. Dr. Okiko? Yeah, let me just share the presentation. Somehow not okay. I don't know if you can see the slides now. The, the call. We can see the slides. Okay, I'm just going to talk about what has been in the news uh, about the product recall, uh, the TDF uh, 3TC DTG uh, product from uh, Universal, which the ministry recalled recently. So I'll just give an overview on uh, what happened uh, to where we are at. So um, a recall basically is a simple English. It just means uh, it's an action to withdraw the drugs from circulation uh, for one reason or the other, mainly because of quality, efficacy, or safety. So uh, the Drug and Poisons Board, the Pharmacy and Poisons Board of Kenya, has guidelines for product recall and a licensor for uh, defective products, yeah. So in several instances, what happens is that uh, during registration, uh, all products are usually undergo um, analysis by the government chemists, uh, where uh, there's a continuous post-marketing surveillance that occurs uh, for most, pro most products, or all drugs in the market. So uh, when you are thinking of a recall, it can uh, basically uh, mean a batch recall, which in this instance, that is what happens. So we, sell, uh, I think, uh, selected batches uh, of the TLD uh, brand from Universal who were found to uh, be defective uh, in the market. I think uh, most of this was applied through the uh, government system by KEMSA uh, to most uh, CCC programs in the, in the country. There is also what you call a specific batch. Um, when this case was brought up, I think uh, we in Kenyatta had this batch and we had quarantined it. And I think the board was investigating on several uh, hospitals which had the same batch here. Yeah. So um, there were two options to do a voluntary recall or a statutory recall. Um, so I'll just define what this means. A voluntary recall means 
uh, the, the owner of the product uh, can initiate this process uh, by reporting to the board uh, because of their findings in the market that they, uh, there's a quality problem that has been reported and they feel it's they'll want to recall all the batches uh, that have been produced in the market. A statutory one uh, is where the board then uh, starts this process on its own. Uh, mostly this is because of a banned product or uh, because of an adverse uh, reaction that has been uh, that's occurred in the in the market. So um, normally there are three classes of uh, recall. So when you analyze such a problem, so when in the first class, usually it means that um, you recall a product when there is reasonable probability that the use of the product will have serious adverse effects and probably this is banned. So normally this is, uh, it's time-based. So it means it has to occur almost immediately or within a week that this product has to be taken off the shelves of the market of the retail uh, and probably all patients followed up. In class two, it means if it's a class two recall, it means that the exposure of, of this product may cause temporarily cause adverse uh, health consequences or where the probability of serious adverse events are, is quite remote, which uh, we feel uh, probably this is the class two recall for the TLD that is in circulation. Class three is where probably there is no cause for alarm. So here uh, it needs a discussion. They may probably may not want to recall, but you may warn the company. So what happened here is that we found their batches uh, that were in the market, uh, that they were defective in the sense there was discoloration. I think most of our patients are getting discoloration or deformed uh, pills in their, uh, when they are taking their medications. And we also saw that some of the packaging, their seals were missing, and we thought it was a specific batch, but uh, eventually I think there are almost eight batches that were found to have had this issue. So what has happened now is that um, the board and the company, um, the company called for voluntary recall. So it's actually the universal that has requested that uh, from the board uh, that we want to recall all this, uh, the batches that were manufactured and these particular batches that are shown here, uh, which we are kind of, the process is currently ongoing and we hope within 30 days, this batch will be off the market. And we hope that all our patients will be at a safer place. So to ensure uh, this process is smooth, um, we'll want to show a bit uh, to the team what uh, this product looks like. This is our preferred regimen that we're using for most of our patients, I think 80-90% of our patients uh, on this regimen. And so uh, what you're saying is uh, if you have you know, a patient or if you have a relative, a friend, uh, probably the patient, and you, are, you have this product, you're not too sure whether it's one of, so long as you see this word universal, uh, the one in red, we're asking that you bring all your products back to uh, most of the most of this batch was supplied to government. So we are asking that you bring it back to your nearest hospital facility um, so that you can get an exchange of a similar product from a different company. I think we currently have a Milan brand in the market and we are exchanging all and taking down the records of the patients that have been using this. So we'll be exchanging this brand in the market. So there's really no need to worry, but we request that all patients to come back to the pharmacies, uh, to the hospitals uh, for guidance or for disposal of, of these products. Uh, back to you, Dr. Kamal, thank you. Dr. Kamal. Hello, Dr. Kamal. Hello, Dr. Okiko. Perhaps um, you can yes. stop sharing. Okay. Then I can share my slides. Please, Dr. Rumi. Sorry. 
So, uh, good afternoon once more. Uh, I will take you through COP22 priorities and maybe just to provide more, more information about this. Each year in Kenya, um, we normally get guidance in terms of areas where we need to focus when we are doing programming, primarily because data will inform us um, on where we are doing query as a country or uh, where there are gaps in the process Dr. of- uh, Apologies for interrupting. Sure. We are not able to see your slides from uh, our end. Oh, sorry. Let me, let me try to reshare once more. Dr. Okiko, confirm that you can now see? No, we can't see, not yet. We can't see, sorry. Yeah. I think that's what we had uh, as the focus areas uh, for COP22, but suffice to say that there are these other three elements that I've not discussed, um, the viral load, uh, uptake and resort utilization. We still have gaps in terms of being able to timely provide interventions to clients who have high viral load. And um, the other area is screening for mental health illnesses and providing an uh, integrated care within our clinics. For cervical cancer, is, is to ensure that we set up system for screening of cervical cancer and uh, providing you know, a one-stop shop model for treatment for those with lesions that can be managed uh, using cryotherapy or thermal abra uh, abrasion, but also uh, being able to establish a referral pathway for those with uh, advanced lesions so that they can get appropriate care. Thank you. And back to you, Dr. Kamau. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Ramunio. Uh, we'll now go to uh, the Q&A session for a few minutes. I've been able to answer some of the questions, maybe. Okay, so I'll start by saying that the pivoting ring has been um, approved, but it's not available yet. Um, um, it's not yet available. So, the question was, um, what advice would you give a female client who would like to use the WV ring ring, who is also using the IUCD, maybe due to hypertension or bleeding? So let me just clarify this. The WV ring ring is, um, is a vaginal ring, and IUCD will be put inside um, the uterus. So, um, yeah, so they are in different locations. But for this patient, I mean, if they don't have any renal, uh, re renal issues, um, they could still use. Uh, they could still use. So, so this. So maybe, maybe Salome, you can clarify whether you mean for prep. But it's not yet available locally. Yeah. Um, but for prep. Unless your UECs are deranged, I mean, they could they could probably use the um, uh, TDF, UTC, or something that's safer on the kidneys. Uh, tough, tenofovir, alafenamide, plus um, emtricitabine. So there's a question for those who above fifty years. Um, are they new patients? Uh, so they are prolonging their lives. Um, have they been on ARV, so prolonging their lifetime? So uh, majority of these patients actually have been on ART for long. For the exact percentages, uh, I'll, I'll give them to you shortly. So 
Um, ECD4 still being used as a baseline in this era of test and treat. Yes, it's still being used as a baseline test, but it's not determining whether you are going to be initiated on ART. So it's still being used as a baseline. And why you need to do the CD4 is just to check the level of immunosuppression in a patient. So for patients who have CD4 counts above 200 as baseline, these are patients who have early uh, HIV disease. For those whose CD4 counts are less than 200, they have advanced HIV disease. So for every new patient you encounter, you need to find out whether they are early disease or advanced HIV disease. Because we know the patients with advanced HIV disease are at risk of, um, are, are at higher risk of HIV associated mortality and morbidity. For these patients with advanced um, HIV disease, the package of care needs to just be preventing the morbidity and the mortality. And the even studies that have been done where, where patients are put on prophylaxis that included things like azithromycin, TB preventive therapy, um, I think even albendazole, and it showed lower mortality. So basically what you want to do, and, and that has um, informed a lot of what we do for the package for advanced HIV disease. So that's why we need to do um, the CD4 counts. Mm. For PCR test for HIV is able to detect the virus after how long and how long after infection. So within two weeks, you'll be able to get a positive DNA PCR, um, but you're safer at four weeks. Um, I think how to get the slides, they'll be posted later on. Um, have I missed? Okay, so someone says, um, for how long can one take PrEP before unprotected sex? And this is an anonymous question. Okay. So, okay. For how long can one take PrEP before unprotected sex? Now this question is, I'll answer it in two ways. If you're a man and you take PrEP using the event-driven PrEP. So if you take it um, two to 24 hours before, before two, yeah, two to 12 hours before that the suspected event, then within two hours, you'll be able to get levels that can prevent HIV infection. But if you're a woman, you'd need to have taken PrEP for a week for you to, for you to get levels that will prevent HIV infection. Okay. Is it possible for one to get the hard copy of the new regimen if one is not working in, or I don't know if they're talking about the new guidelines, even as for NKNH have not gotten the hard copies. So kindly, may you expound further on why we don't give TDF to those who are less than 30 kgs and the choice of um, ERT for neonates. Okay, so, so what informs us whether we can give drugs to children is based on research and looking at how stable the pharmacokinetics, how stable the drug is absorbed, uh, distributed, metabolized. And for neonates, um, those pharmacokinetics Cocainetics are not stable for, for drugs like ABC and dolutegravir. So for neonates, it's not safe for you to give um, ABC and dolutegravir. Um, and, and, and really what informs us is when you do those pharmacokinetic studies and also the dosing, the, the, the drugs, the, the availability of those doses that they need for them to for you to treat the infection. All those are done within pharmacokinetic studies and the pharmacokinetic studies have informed us that the increased risk of adverse effects in neonates for those drugs. And that's why we give drugs like AZT, 3TC, and nevirapine, which are not harmful, which the, which the immature um, metabolic system of the neonate will be able to metabolize without um, adverse effects. Okay, I did not get the explanation of what can happen to a neonate born of HIV positive mother who does not, who decides not to breastfeed at all. So they still get infant prophylaxis and that's nevirapine for 12 weeks for the mothers who decide not to breastfeed. Um, what is the advantage or disadvantage of negative HIV? If HIV negative uses the drugs tdf tc combination for a long time for three years or more. Maybe Hillary, you can clarify, but I think, uh, are they using it to prevent HIV infection? Because if they're using it to prevent HIV infection, you don't need to give um, 
uh, don't you take gravy, but I suspect, I don't know, um, probably they're just at risk of adverse effects of the drugs without um, necessarily having to, to take um, all those drugs. But I don't know whether the setting is for prevention of HIV infection or they're just taking what they see their partner taking. So, I mean, there's really no need to take it. So that's the risk, um, they risk um, getting adverse effects, especially if they're taking TBF. I mean, there's risk of renal toxicity. I think there's an interesting question by Jack Ndongo, how long can a HIV patient live for? And I mean, their life expectancies are near with ART and when they're virally suppressed, their life expectancies are near those who are um, living without HIV. I don't know, Nelson, whether we've answered all the questions. Uh, yes, you've covered most of them. Um, yeah, I can see you've covered most of them. Um, we, I'm still waiting for the percentage of those who have been on care versus those who are new about 50 years. I'm sorry, come on again, Dr. Amboui. Um, maybe we can be getting closing remarks or maybe any further questions. Um, those are excellent presentations from Dr. Romonio and Dr. Okiko. Okay. Yes, we can go ahead and get the final remarks from uh, both Dr. Romonio and Dr. Okiko with regards to their presentations and the questions they've been asked. Okay, let me go first. I think, thank you, Dr. Kamo, for the chance uh, to celebrate this World AIDS Day uh, with sensitizing uh, basically the whole team on the uh, uh, stands that uh, everyone is taking to ensure that our patients get uh, safer ARTs. Um, I've seen several concerns on, uh, I think, looking at the questions. Um, I think HIV, we may not be where we want to be in terms of uh, management of, uh, of HIV, but we've made strides. And I'd like to encourage everyone that in this time, I think that whatever little that you do, where we are, let's do to our best so that we ensure that uh, we are achieving uh, our 95, 95, 95 targets. Yeah. Thank you. Happy World AIDS Day. So uh, thank you very much. Um, looking at the questions, I think uh, Dr. Kamau, you've been able to answer most of them. I cannot see one that specifically was addressed to me and has not been answered. But uh, as part of my closing remarks is just to say that um, we, we've made great strides as a, as a country and uh, really uh, clients that we continue to see in the clinics, are living a long and productive life. And therefore, uh, we should continue encouraging people to get to know their status because we now have interventions that work and um, be able to encourage our clients to, to retain, to be, to be continued in, in care because those that fall out are the ones that, you know, we now see uh, being admitted in the hospitals, and, uh, and, and, and dying. But really the clients who have perfect adherence and uh, where we are able to monitor the treatment uh, uh, success through viral load and they are having a detectable viral load, we see them living long, looking healthy and um, being able to be productive. And therefore, you know, ART has really trans transformed the the HIV, HIV disease into a chronic illness. And uh, more and more, it should be integrated as part of you know, the chronic uh, care treatment in, in, in our hospitals. Uh, uh, 
like, uh, you know, the way we have the medical patient clinic for diabetes and, and so on. So we've really made strides as a country and uh, the, the drugs nowadays are safer and, um, and we really hope that even in future, we'll be able even to get more safer drugs as research continue uh, to, to be done. So there is hope uh, even as we celebrate this World AIDS Day. Thank you. So I don't know, I dropped off. I'm sorry. I don't know that Dr. Okiko has given his closing remarks. Yes, uh, yeah. both uh, Dr. Okiko and uh, Dr. Munyu have. Okay, so I, I think mine is just to say that, um, like I said, more than more than 80% of those patients were actually not new patients. So they've been on ERT for longer than five years. So basically it's just showing us that HIV is no longer a death sentence and people are living longer with HIV. So we now need to start thinking about NCDs in HIV and seeing how aging is affecting HIV and how HIV is affecting aging. I, I mean, for me, that spells hope. And I encourage us on this World AIDS Day to ensure that each and every one of us knows their HIV status and are doing all we can to prevent um, new infections, to prevent HIV related death and to make sure that the stigma um, that's associated with HIV is zero. HIV is now a chronic illness, just like diabetes and um, hypertension and should be treated as so by all of us. So thank you so much. Um, in case anyone needs a HIV test, you're more than welcome to visit um, one of our service delivery points like the VCT, the youth center, depending on your age. And if you're living with HIV and you need a place to seek care and treatment, you're more than welcome to come to CNHCCC. We have all the services that will be able to support you in your journey. Um, thank you and over. Nelson, over to you. All right, thank you so much for your inputs, Dr. Wangui. If I may take you back a bit, I can see you had uh, mentioned uh, the percentage of uh, patients who've been on ART for more than 10 years. Would you mind kindly repeating that for participants? Yeah, so I mean, 86% of our patients had actually been on ERT. Um, in the chart, I wrote longer than 10 years, but it's actually longer than five years. So majority of our patients are not new HIV diagnosis above 50. So there are very few HIV diagnosis um, above on the age above 50 years. Most of them will acquire HIV when they are 30 to 40 years and have lived on long with it. And so we have patients who are actually aging, even up to 80 years old who have been on, you know, on drugs for a long time or have lived with the virus for a long time. So, I mean, if you really want to look at it scientifically, I mean, there are many explanations for it, but with good ART, um, they actually, we are actually lowering mortality associated with HIV. And I think that's where we all aspire to take our patients to a place where they're able to live just as normally as everybody else and not only survive. I think what I want us to take home with is we don't want our patients to survive living with HIV, but we want them to thrive even as they live with HIV. And we'll only do this when we equalize and we stop all these inequalities that are making this pandemic last longer. So over. All right, so mine is just to thank you once again, uh, you and the whole of the uh, comprehensive care uh, team in uh, joining us to commemorate uh, this year's World's AIDS Day. Uh, we are very much uh, appreciated for your inputs and also for the, for the knowledge that you've been able to share with us today. Thank you, we can drop out. Yes, uh, also, uh, I don't know whether Janet, uh, you'd like to have a word or a remark? 
Yes, uh, thank you all. My name is Janet Handa from Gilead. I appreciate uh, Dr. Ramonio, uh, Dr. Okiko, and Dr. Kamau for an excellent presentation and taking us through the guidelines. Um, it is World AIDS Day today, and I know a lot of uh, activities being done. So thank you all for the work that you're doing. I've seen a number of people asking on the chat about the guidelines. Actually, if you go to the NASCOP website, you can download a, a, a soft copy of the your full guidelines are for your review. I know they gave out hard copies during the launch, but the soft copy is available at the NASCOP website. So thank you all. Um, continue the good work that you're doing uh, and let's manage this. Thank you. Uh, that was Janet from Gilead. The, 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 they have sponsors to, sorry, they have supported us. Uh, in uh, in today's session, uh, actually putting everything together. So we also appreciate you on your end, Janet, with uh, Gilead. Thank you.